tonight on the front lines of media, politics, and culture. Drag is love, and that's the message. LGBTQ leaders. Somebody else's compartmentalization of me doesn't bound me to being what they want me to be. Breaking new ground for representation. It's a long time coming. And acceptance. They said, you're still our kid. We love you no matter what. While battling against a backlash. We need a cross-the-country solution. People are afraid of what they don't know. This is Pride Out Front. I'm Joe Fryer. Thanks for joining us in Happy Pride. How you celebrate Pride this year may depend on where you live. In some parts of the country, lawmakers are trying to restrict drag performances, while in other places, drag queens can take the stage without any limits. In a growing number of states, gender-affirming care for transgender minors is now illegal, while other parts of the country are opening their arms to trans kids and their families. Right now, when it comes to LGBTQ rights, it seems we are living in two very different worlds. And those tensions are not just felt in state capitol buildings. They're playing out in the sports world, in corporate America, and in pop culture. And often, it's drag queens in the trans community who are thrust out front. Even the longest-running show on Broadway, a musical that has been around since 1996, can still do something it has never done before. This year, Jinx Monsoon became the first drag queen to play Matron Mama Morton in Chicago. Drag queens would be doing this more often if if the odds weren't stacked up against us, you know? (laughs) Jinx defied the odds. Her run was so successful it was extended by two weeks. And with Monsoon on the marquee, Chicago had the highest grossing non-holiday week in the show's 26-year history. We're at a point in history where we want to turn the corner and have certain things not be such a big deal anymore. Yet, while Jinx was selling out shows in Manhattan, Tennessee lawmakers were passing a first-of-its-kind bill restricting drag performances in that state. One of the sponsors, State Senate Majority Leader Jack Johnson, spoke with NBC's Antonia Hilton. Are you trying to send a signal that some types of communities, some types of people aren't welcome here in Tennessee? The only signal I'm trying to send is that you shouldn't be doing sexually graphic, you shouldn't be simulating sex acts in front of children. Critics of the law say it's too broad, unfairly painting drag as overtly sexual. Still, Florida lawmakers also voted to restrict drag shows, with other states considering whether to follow suit. Does it feel like we're living in two different worlds? There are people who want progress and to move forward, and there are people who want to either stay where we are or move backwards. We're done tiptoeing around that conversation. You either get on board with sharing this planet with the rest of the people who live here, or be left in the dust because the rest of us aren't waiting for you to catch up. This month, Tennessee's drag ban was declared unconstitutional by a federal judge. Before that, though, the drag drama created a dilemma for musicians like Lizzo. Why would I not come to the people who need to hear this message the most? Lizzo didn't just take the stage in Knoxville. She shared it with several local drag queens. The debate is hitting every corner of culture, from music to sports. Like when the LA Dodgers made plans to honor the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence at the team's Pride Night. The Sisters are a group of drag nuns known for their service work, but Catholic groups complained, saying the Sisters were offensive. You're asking for war with Catholics, quite frankly. I mean, a culture war. In response, the Dodgers threw a curve uninviting the sisters from Pride Night. It was the speed at which they capitulated that surprised us and dismayed us. But that sparked a backlash from the LGBTQ community. Before long, the Dodgers were apologizing and re-inviting the sisters. When our community clearly supports us and is here for us. Drag is just one hot-button issue. The Human Rights Campaign says this year, more than 520 anti-LGBTQ bills were introduced in state legislatures, a record. In Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis signed a slew of bills, including an expansion of what critics call the Don't Say Gay law. We're protecting kids, and we're going to protect kids when uh, when it's popular. We'll protect kids even when, when you take some incoming... Right-wing groups are also targeting brands, like Target, 
The retailer pulled some Pride products off store shelves, citing threats to employees. I think there's this really small group who has an outsized voice at this moment in time, and it's of hate. And it's of hit discrimination and it's violent. And then there was this. Hi. Trans influencer Dylan Mulvaney posted one Instagram video as part of a brand partnership with Bud Light. This month I celebrated my day 365 of womanhood and Bud Light sent me possibly the best gift ever, a can with my face on it. Quickly, a backlash brewed with conservatives calling for a boycott. For Bud Light, sales sunk, but Mulvaney was also caught in the crossfire. I think it's okay to be frustrated with someone or confused, but what I'm struggling to understand is the need to dehumanize and to be cruel. Some LGBTQ bars also boycotted Bud Light, saying the company didn't do enough to support Mulvaney. For Jinx Monsoon, support is key. The drag star says now is the time for people to stand up for the LGBTQ community. I think it's so easy to be an ally when things are fun, when it's drag competitions on television show and makeovers and and fashion, you know. But we're asking you to be an ally right now for the tough stuff, too. Jinx Monsoon, of course, appeared on RuPaul's Drag Race. We're going to continue this conversation with two other stars from that show. Britta Filter joins us here in studio, a drag star and political activist. And another drag star, Kennedy Davenport, a TV personality and actor, joins us remotely from Texas. Thank you both for joining us. You know, Britta, we were just a couple days into Pride Month when a federal judge came down and said that that drag ban in Tennessee, the restrictions there were unconstitutional. What was your reaction when you heard that news? Uh, you know, it's it's crazy to me and it, it hurts me and, and our community. I think that what they're really trying to do is that they're coming for our transgender siblings. I mean, this I can take off. And w looking at the law itself, it, it's just, it, it's insane because it, 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 it's it's coming for uh, those who live their life authentically. Did you feel some relief when you heard a federal judge say, no, nope, this is unconstitutional? Uh, well, when I heard that, I, I I was relieved because it's it's something that we need and it's something beautiful for pride, <laughs> something for us to celebrate. Kennedy, uh, earlier this year, you were on stage at the CMT Awards with country star Kelsey Ballerini, along with some other drag queens. I mean, this is an audience that's perhaps more conservative than the folks who are watching RuPaul's Drag Race or coming to some of your other performances. What was it like being up there during that show and what made you decide to be a part of that? I thought it was a great opportunity because it's, it had never been done before. And then when we got there, everybody treated us with such respect and love and gave us a warm welcome. And the statement didn't really hit me until afterwards or like when we were on the stage and we saw the pride flag lit on the floor and all around us it was just a momentous moment Britta, when we hear from lawmakers who are promoting anti-trans legislation or legislation that is aimed at drag performances we often hear them say it's about children and protecting children. When you hear that, what's your response? It has nothing to do with protecting children. I mean, essentially, as a drag queen, I am just as dressed up as a Disney princess is at, at Disneyland. Um, and it and it's not protecting children at all. Um, what it is, is it, it, they're truly just coming for trans individuals when they do this anti-drag legislation. And it's crazy to me. Kennedy, right. what do you think is the key to combating the narrative and to getting people to feel more compassion toward the LGBTQ community amid all of the legislation we've seen over the last few years? I really think, um, I kind of relate it to um, people that really don't know who you are and don't know how you live and judge you based on that them not knowing you. You know, I think a lot of it is people just being uneducated. Like people, people are afraid of what they yes. don't know. Drag queens were the people who uh, were the Stonewall Uprising in 1969. They were the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence during the AIDS crisis, helping out our, uh, you know, siblings with AIDS and HIV. Um, so we we go so far back and I think people are afraid because they, they've they never experienced or encountered a drag queen before. On top of that, we are, we are people. We go through the same thing 
any heterosexual or who, whatever you want to call yourself, we <laughs> we have gone through the same thing, if not more. And drag and people ask me, what is drag to you? Drag is total liberation. So when we have the opportunity to perform or to be in front of people, that's our opportunity to release whatever's going on. And we share everything that we've been through on stage through performance. Drag is love. And that's, and that's the message. Kennedy Davenport, Britta Filter, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Still ahead, we'll speak to lawmakers from both sides of the aisle about the sudden rise in bills against trans rights. For the LGBTQ community, state legislatures have turned into battlegrounds, but the front line of that battle looks very different depending on where you live. As we mentioned, the Human Rights Campaign says this year we've seen 520 plus anti-LGBTQ bills introduced at the state level. Of those, more than 220 specifically target transgender and non-binary people. Zoe Zephyr, a Democratic representative in Montana, was censured after she spoke out about a bill that banned gender-affirming care for minors. If you vote yes on this bill and yes on these amendments, I hope the next time there's an invocation, when you bow your heads in prayer, you see the blood on your hands. While some states push for restrictions, others are putting protections in place. Joining me to discuss those two opposing realities, two transgender trailblazers in state government, Representative Zephyr, who we just saw speaking, and Minnesota State Representative Lee Finke, that state's first openly transgender state lawmaker and the chief author of a trans refuge bill, welcoming those seeking gender-affirming health care. Thank you both for joining us. Representative Zephyr, I want to start with you. You were censured because you told lawmakers they had blood on their hands. They felt that comment cross the line. Do you have any regrets at all about what you said there? When I stood up on that bill to speak about it, I was talking to real harm that these types of bills bring. We know that trans youth who access gender affirming care have a 73% reduction in suicidality. I know the impact these bills have, and I was holding the Republicans accountable for trying to pass legislation like this. I have no regrets in doing so. Representative Finke, on the flip side, Minnesota's governor signed your bill, which made Minnesota a trans refugee state. Explain to us what exactly does this law do? Yeah, so the trans refuge law is meant to protect people who are receiving or seeking gender affirming care in states that have outlawed access to that care. And this bill says, if you come to the state of Minnesota to receive that care, we will shield you from the laws of your state that would seek to prosecute you. Um, when we started this in January, there were eight states um, that had banned gender affirming care. Uh, by the time we passed it, there were 11 including three of our bordering states, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa. So it's a desperate need for our community to be able to envision a place where they can receive care, um, where they can have their transition-related health care not interrupted, um, and continue to live the lives um, that all people simply want to live with access to health care. So, Representative Finke, to the critics who were against this, who say that this undermines parental rights, what's your response to that? Removing access from children undermines parental rights. Providing health care options to everyone is a way that we not only, as Representative Zephyr said, keep our children alive and healthy, but it allows families to have the autonomous decisions that we want families and parents to be making with their children. Representative Zephyr, when you heard what Minnesota was doing, what went through your mind? What was your reaction? Two things. One, it is nice to see what uh, healthcare can look like when a state decides to take the step to protect trans people who need access to the care. But the other thing I see is when you see such um, harmful legislation coming into states like Montana, so much so that states like Minnesota are passing, as Representative Finke said, refugee laws. That distinction between the states points to me that, one, we need states doing that in this moment, but two, we need federal action because we need a, a cross-the-country solution that will take care of the trans people who need access to our health care to live happy, 
and fulfilling lives. Representative Zephyr and Finke, thank you both for joining us for this important conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you for having us. For more on the growing legislation targeting the LGBTQ community, especially the trans community, I'm joined by two people who can speak about this issue both personally and professionally. Ileana ross and represented Florida in the House of Representatives from 1989 to 2019 as a Republican. Her son, Rodrigo Hang Leighton, is the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Thank you both for joining us. Um, Congresswoman, I want to start with you. I was doing research for this interview. I was looking at something you said back in 2019. You said at the time you had hope for the GOP, that the party was becoming more tolerant and more accepting when it came to these issues. I have to ask, four years later, has that hope faded at all? It hasn't faded because uh, for a long time I was in the hope business, and I'm still in the hope business. There's a deluge of, uh, of stories about what is apparently the number one threat to our American way of life, which is trans youth. Yeah, and I'm looking around and I say, we don't feel that way about Rigo, our son, who's a transgender male. I don't think that we're blinded by the, our love for Rigo. We see all of our children in the same way, unconditional love, uh, because what's the alternative? Homelessness, drug use, kids getting kicked out of their homes, even contemplating suicide. And what we see is Enrigo, he's got wonderful values of kindness and, and uh, looking out for, uh, for our community. We couldn't ask for a better kid. And I wish that my party and our community and everybody's family would look at their children in the same way, no matter what they're going through. It, it's appalling. This is the low point for my, for my party. I'm proud to be a Republican, but we better get our act together. Rodrigo, I can see it brings a smile to your face to hear your mom talk about you in such glowing terms. I have to say, as someone who focuses on transgender policy, this deluge your mom was talking about this year, what has it been like for you? Well, it's been heartbreaking for myself, but so many transgender people to feel like now there is a target being put on our backs, and especially for transgender youth, for our kids, who are really being single-handedly uh, targeted for all this negative legislation. Um, you know, as was shared, I, I was very fortunate that my family accepted me. I'm a transgender man. That means I was uh, raised as a girl, uh, but then transitioned to live as the man I know myself to be. And I'm so grateful that my parents said from the very beginning, even if they were shocked and even if they didn't understand it. They said, you're still our kid. We love you no matter what. But what I'm really working on and what National Center for Transgender Equality as an organization works on is for that to be everybody's experience, for that to be the norm instead of something special. Now you know why we're so proud of Rigo. Uh, he's, he's, he's got his act together. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Rodrigo, what will it take to make it so that your experience is a much more common experience? It's going to take everyday Americans getting to know their transgender neighbors. Transgender people are part of the fabric of society, just like everybody else. And the good news is that we've always seen that the more that everyday Americans get to know another transgender person, the more they realize we're not some boogeyman under the bed. They will see through all of the myths and the misinformation and come to see all of this legislation for what it is, which is just hostility. And they'll stand up to it. Congresswoman, for parents of trans kids who are struggling to accept their children or for just everyday citizens who are watching this debate right now and they're struggling to fully understand this issue, just as a mom, what is your advice to them? What is at stake here is your son or your daughter's survival as a person. And you, we want all of our children to be productive citizens and, and positive uh, contributors to our American way of life. And all of these issues are family issues. But we shouldn't have a one-size-fits-all law uh, that, that bans uh, you know, gender care. Uh, for for individuals, uh, I think that's uh, that's that's horrific. That's barbaric. You know, the GOP. We our our history is that we're a party of 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 uh, local control, local authority, free expression, and now we've got a one size fits all for transgender uh, youth, and I think that that's wrong. So I'm optimistic that things will get better rather than get worse. Congresswoman and Rodrigo, mom and son, 
thank you both for joining us for this conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you, it. Joe. You're looking good, Rigo. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Actress Trace Lissette stars in the new movie, Monica. It's about a trans woman who returns home to care for her dying mother, a mother who had rejected her as a teen. Critics say the movie, quote, raises the bar for trans stories on screen. What's your name? Again, please remind me. Monica. I'm joined now by Trace Lissette. Congratulations on the movie. What does it mean right now to have a movie with a transgender star as the lead? It's a long time coming, um, especially it's, I mean, it's not lost on me that it's incredibly timely right now. This role and this film are deeply important to me and the trans community just on the strength that it allows people to see us and our humanity in a way that is delicate and ordinary and familiar in a family way. Um, and just being the lead of it, and I don't know, it's, 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 it's been a hard fought win for me and, and I'm proud, I'm very proud. You've said Monica's journey is a journey you understand. Do you hope through this movie, people who see it will also have a better understanding? Yeah, I mean, that's my hope is that, I mean, they, they get to see what she's going through um, as a fully formed, well-lived in trans woman who's had to navigate this rough life for a very long time on her own. This is not a, a story that's like foreign to the trans experience. It's pretty typical for us to have issues with our blood family um, or to even be abandoned by them. But um, I think that subject can be a little daunting for people and maybe seeing yes, it through this film nasty. will make it make a little more sense to them. You are an artist. When it comes to changing hearts and minds, what is the role that art can play? I think art can be a bit of a Trojan horse sometimes because it comes wrapped in the form of entertainment. Hearing someone's personal story is always the most powerful thing. Um, Interpersonal relationships from people of different walks of life have shifted my view on so many things. So I, I feel like for me, that's, that's my shot at reaching the masses, middle America, to just see us and see our similarities. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You. Coming up, how the Tony Awards are making history with this year's nominations, but also facing calls to create more inclusive categories. The theater world has long been a welcoming place for the LGBTQ community, but new questions are being raised around award shows like the Tonys, the annual ceremony that honors the best of Broadway. That show still has categories that honor actors and actresses, which means that non-binary and gender non-conforming performers feel left out. Now some are calling for change. I got the eye on the time. The Broadway musical Anne Juliet features a groundbreaking role, a non-binary character named May, I a boy and I liked it. played by a non-binary performer named Justin David Sullivan. Do you feel a personal connection with this character? Beyond, yes. When I read the script for the first time and I learned about the character for the first time, I was so taken aback by uh, just how truthful it felt to my own story. While the show scored nine Tony nominations, Sullivan is not competing for a trophy. They opted out of award eligibility because they had to choose between one of two categories, actor or actress. Sullivan said, I could not in good faith move forward with denying any part of my identity to conform to a system and structure that does not hold space for people like me. It is truly one of the most selfless, respectable things that one person could do. Broadway star Alex Newell is also non-binary and currently stars in the musical Shucked. I'm independently owned and complicated. Newell is nominated after choosing to enter the featured actor category. Well, I, being the thespian and actor that I've been, I've always deemed actor as a gender neutral term. But Newell is glad that Sullivan's decision to abstain is sparking discussion. Do you hope it prompts some sort of change? It has to, because what we're doing, we're closing great, talented people out. 
Newell made history this year, becoming one of the first openly non-binary performers to score a Tony nomination, along with J. Harrison G., star of Some Like It Hot, who chose to enter the lead actor category. How did you make that decision, and do you think things do need to change when it comes to how we give awards out to folks? There's always room for growth, and uh, what helped make it easy for me is I'm always going to show up in my fullness no, no matter where I am, and somebody else's compartmentalization of me doesn't bound me to being what they want me to be. It's not just a Broadway issue. The Grammys already eliminated gendered categories in 2012, and the MTV Awards followed suit in 2017. As for the Tonys, in a statement earlier this year, the American Theater Wing, which produces the Tony Awards, said, We recognize that the current acting categories are not fully inclusive, and we are currently in discussion about how to best adjust them to address this, offering hope to stars like Justin David Sullivan that change to be waiting in the wings. There is more work to do, but also so much that has been accomplished. I hope you can take some time during this Pride Month to celebrate and reflect on all of the achievements made by the LGBTQ community. I'm Joe Fryer. Thanks for watching and happy Pride. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.